So, we talked about acids and bases. We talked about the three ways that you used to determine the pH or the relative pH of unknown solutions that you were provided with. And then knowing that the pH meter was the most accurate, you then used the pH meter in the alkali experiment to determine which of those solutions had the most basic or alkaline pH. After that, what you did in the final experiment in the acids and bases lab involved something that was known as buffers. So again, you're using your pH meter and you're going to look at these solutions that are known as buffers. So what is a buffer? Well, a buffer is defined as a solution that is capable of maintaining its initial pH with the addition of an acid or a base. And I'm going to put here, in parentheses, to a degree. And I'll explain that in just a second. So what this means is, if we have a solution that's a buffer, whatever pH that buffer starts at, when we add acid or base to that buffer, it should maintain that pH, or at least a pH very close to that, to a degree. A solution's ability to maintain its initial pH is known as the buffering capacity. So that is defined as the degree slash ability of a solution to both act as a buffer and thereby and maintain its initial pH. So there are differing degrees of buffers. There can be some buffers that can maintain their pH for a little while with the addition of a small amount of acid or base. There are others that might have a really high buffering capacity and can then maintain their pH with the addition of much more acid or base. And so what you did in this exercise was you had two solutions, solution A and solution B, and you systematically added in a milliliter uh, dropwise fashion either an acid or a base to each solution and measured the pH as you did that. Okay, so if I draw this on the board, okay, so we had solution A, and you took its initial pH, and we had solution B, and you took its initial pH. Okay, and I think what you probably came out with was both of these had an initial pH that was relatively close to 7. Now, one thing that students do sometimes confuse and get lost on is they think that all buffers must have a pH of 7 initially. That's not true. Buffers can have any pH for the most part. So these buffers could have just as easily started at a pH of 4. And if that were the case, then the one of these that would be the better buffer would be the one that could retain a pH of 4 for a longer period of time. Okay? Since both of these solutions started at a pH of 7, we're looking for the one that maintains a pH of 7 for the longest period of time with the addition of an acid or a base. So what you then found was the following. So I'm going to draw out my graph. Okay, and we're going to title this buffering capacity. The 
This is relative buffering capacity of these solutions. Okay, so on my y-axis, I have my pH going from 0, 7, and 14. On my x-axis, I'm actually going to split it and have 0 here in the middle and 10 at either end. And what this represents is in this direction, it represents the addition of hydrochloric acid in a milliliter style process. So at each of these hash marks, I'm adding one milliliter of hydrochloric acid to my solution, either solution A or solution B. And the same thing exists over here. As I go in this direction, I'm increasing the relative concentration of sodium hydroxide that I'm adding, or that is in the solution. So at each hash mark, I'm adding one mil of sodium hydroxide, thereby increasing the sodium hydroxide concentration in my solution A or solution B. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Okay. So what you've most likely found for solution A was as you added hydrochloric acid, you saw a very, very dramatic decrease in pH almost immediately with the addition of hydrochloric acid. Okay. And then when you added sodium hydroxide, I think you saw a very dramatic increase. Maybe not up to 14, but a very dramatic increase all the same in pH. Okay, so this is solution A. Now with solution B, what you most likely saw was as you add hydrochloric acid, you see a slight dip in pH, but it retains that pH for the most part until you get way out here where you've added now 10 mils of hydrochloric acid, and then you might have seen a sudden drop off. Okay? Now, one thing I need to note here is even if solution B were to drop off dramatically and go below the pH of solution A at this point, solution B would still be determined to be the best buffer or have the best buffering capacity. Because look at how long it was able to retain its relative pH compared to solution A. Okay, solution A didn't even have the ability or capacity to maintain its pH with one mil of hydrochloric acid added. Whereas solution B was able to maintain a pH relatively similar to its initial pH with the addition of multiple milliliters of hydrochloric acid. And you probably saw the same thing happen when you added sodium hydroxide to solution B. So B is the dashed line, A is the solid line, and going off of this graph, what we see, and this is hopefully similar to what you saw with your results, was that B retains its initial pH better with the addition of acid or base than A does. So because B is able to maintain a pH close to its initial pH with the addition of more acid or base than A, B has the best buffering capacity. So B has the greatest buffering capacity. That is, the ability to act as a buffer, B is the best. Now, if we had a third solution, C, that was able to do something that looked like this, where it constantly just basically stayed exactly at its initial pH, then C would then be the, the particular solution with the greatest buffering capacity. So when we say greatest buffering capacity, it's a relative term meant to compare multiple solutions. In your exercise, you were comparing A and B. If we had a third solution that looked like this, we would be comparing A, B, and C. And to that degree, we could then say C has the greatest buffering capacity, and it has a better buffering capacity than A or B. But we could still say that B has a better buffering capacity than A. So that was the buffering exercise and the buffering capacity exercise that you performed in lab. So that's it.